Good morning, Harlem. I'm so excited and happy to be here with you. I feel welcomed and pleased. Thank you for inviting me. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Encyclopedia Britannica announced that it was going to stop publishing its print edition. This after 244 years, which is a long time. It's kind of like the end of an era. The CEO said it had nothing to do with Google and Wikipedia. I'm thinking, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's true that print isn't something, that encyclopedia isn't a good format for print. But I actually think it probably had to do with the 145,000 people who every month write and edit articles on Wikipedia. I went online to Wikipedia, looked up their stats. They have four million articles written in the English language and they have 270 language Wikipedias. I mean, how can you compete with that? This is, for me, an example of a trend I've been paying attention to, which is a movement from industrial capitalism to what I think of as the collaborative economy. Industrialization was a tendency where we broke everything down into parts, and there were important people and less important people, and you did your job, and things were very standardized brought about some great things. I think we're really pretty much, we have gone so far in that direction that we pretty much maxed out on it. If you think about the Encyclopedia Britannica writers, you can be sure that there are domain experts, they know exactly what they're talking about, they write those articles, they edit it, and they would never in their wildest dreams imagine that somebody else, unknown people that we didn't know anything about could be writing an encyclopedia, and that's exactly what Wikipedia did. Wikipedia said, hey, all you experts out there, we've built a platform, you go and create this fabulous encyclopedia. You know, I missed a slide. Um, you go create this fascinating encyclopedia because you 145,000 people have all these different areas of expertise, and you're all around the world, and you're gonna be able to pull it together, whereas, the industrial capitalism, all that talent is just a few of us, and all the assets and wealth are controlled by a few. Before, we were all living in hovels, sole proprietorships. I had my own farm, and I was doing my own stuff, you know, worked for myself. Today, 50% of us work for big companies. And those 50, and we think of those big companies, they control vastly more of the assets and wealth than 50%, and they are really controlling the political power now. And I think we're seeing this Occupy movement around the world, and I think it's this pushing back against the excesses and the, the maximum that we've gone to with the industrial economy. So the collaborative economy thrives on this diversity of humans, their talents, their skills, and they're around the world. And what we found with Wikipedia is that it's all about experimentation, learning, adaptation, and evolution. And think about the time we're living in today. We really have to be in a time where we evolve and adapt. We are so, things are moving so incredibly fast. The industrial economy is we want to standardize things, we want to centralize it, and once we figure out the thing, we never want to change off of it because that costs money and who knows where it will lead us. So the industrial economy really wants to defend the status quo. An example that I'm liking is um, AT&T. So it started out as Bell Labs in 1877, it was bought by AT&T in 1899, and it was really founded on amassing patents, 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 so no one could compete. At the peak of AT&T, it had a million people working for it. That's a lot of people. So in 1984, the US government split them up into the seven, and we have one of those seven, AT&T, that we still know today, that is now the largest communications company in the world and is the seventh largest company in the United States. Think of that 130 years of history in which they had to lay cables, build all the stuff, just like the level of effort for that. And I want to contrast that with Skype. Skype is nine years old. It has 663 million people that are using it to communicate. And did they build any physical infrastructure? Zero, none. Where does the infrastructure come from? Us. It's Robin's computer and Robin's hookup that she's already paid for and Robin's video camera. And each of us are bringing the stuff that we have to communicate with the others. And look at the size and scale of it. So we know that the industrial capitalism, how do we know if we succeed? Because we become as big as possible. We're always looking to become a monopoly. How does the collaborative economy work? We seek to maximize participation. The more people we can get involved in it, that's the better we are. 
The collaborative economy goes from this economies of free. So if we think of it's really based on the economics of stuff we've already bought and paid for, which is what happened with Skype, or of excess capacity, which is what's happening with, with Wikipedia. All the stuff and the expertise that I have in my brain and my free time, I contribute that to Wikipedia. And so we're really having to work together, whereas the industrial economy, there's two ways they make money. One is this economies of scale. If I can standardize it and sell a huge amount, I can give you it a low cost. And the other way that they make money is by um, keeping the secrets and the trade patents to myself. So th I'm keeping it all, and if you want to use any of my stuff that I know about, you have to pay a lot of money for it. The collaborative economy is on idea exchange and open standards. Um, Flickr, I just have to give this example because it's such a nice one. Um, Getty has 80 million images. That's a lot, 80 million images that, there's, that they have out there for you to buy. Flickr, nine years, uh, six years, seven years old, and they have six billion images compared to the 80 million. And if you look at this, you know, which one is telling us more about the human ex experience? Which one really expresses intergenerational feelings and what it's really like? And the family there on your, this side, I think, um, you know, here's the perfect family, us and our son. And if that's not perfect enough for you, it can be us and our son and our daughter. Um, more examples, the, the contrast between network TV and YouTube. Uploaded onto YouTube every month is as much content as 60 years of network TV. Um, it even is happening in the banking industry. So we can contrast Bank of America and Capital One with Prosper. Prosper is seven years old. They have 1.3 million people who are participating and lending money to others. They've made $314 million worth of loans. If one of those people goes bankrupt, it's resilient, it's redundant. There's this huge diversity that's spread out, whereas we know the others are too big to fail. But of course, they will one day. Um, moving on. What I really love about the collaborative economy is that it has the possibility to share the value of those, those things. That if we want to maximize participation, well then I have to share those values. I am believing what I preach and I've launched a company um, less than a year ago called Buzzcar, which is taking advantage of these types of things. So Buzzcar is car sharing and car rental on the using individuals' own cars and all that idle capacity that's sitting out there unused on the streets. So who are the people that are participating? Of course, they are. Clicking my clicker. <laughs> of course they are, you know, widely diverse. So there's different kinds of people who have different kinds of cars. Some of them, of course, are shirtless. And um, <laughs> they're all kinds. This is my favorite, Selma. And so all of these people, these people are putting together their car parked in their space that they maintain, and they're getting their friends and their neighbors and colleagues to drive them, and they can make as much as $1,000 a month doing it. And what do we provide? We share this. They get 65% of the revenue. Um, insurance companies get 20% because everyone is, is the insurance we provide and 24 hour roadside assistance. And Buzzcar takes 15% to do all the technology, making it really fast, simple, and easy for people to meet up with standardized contracts using some nice um, smartphone apps. Uh, and who are the drivers? These are the lovely drivers, of course, diverse, and we vet them to make sure they're good drivers. And what is my goal? My goal is to reduce the number of idle cars on the street to make Owning a car costs less money, and for those who don't have a car, they can have access to car mobility at a much reduced price. So I want to change transportation, and I'm not the only one. Um, there's in the transportation sector is another example, carpooling.com. I didn't say bus cars coming to Harlem in a couple of weeks, so sign up. Um, the collaborative economy of carpooling.com, they were founded 10 years ago in Germany. Today, three and a half million people are ride sharing with them and that's 33,000 trips a day, about over a million a month, and the distance that they're going, it's like to the moon and back 125 times each month. Enormous groups of people joining together to get things done. Um, what's fabulous about Prosper and Buzzcar and carpooling and the collaborative economy is that intangibles are visible and valued. You know, one dollar is not like any other dollar. The fact that I can get it 99 cents instead of a dollar is not the issue. I want to choose the one that has real people behind it doing things that I love and that are bringing to me their expertise and their value. And we find this with Buzzcar and with carpooling that people are giving great directions, they're throwing in, they had car seats, they're telling you the best places to go, and you can't get that with a standard company. 
And I want to close here with um, an example that some of you guys may or may not know, but I just, it's a wonderful example. So if we compare Google Maps to a company called OpenStreetMaps, with Google Maps, with both of these examples, the maps are created using satellite imagery and, and on-the-ground work, and it's experts who are looking at those and putting it together. Um, when there was the earthquake in Haiti, let me get to this slide. Um, this is a vi Haiti, there was the earthquake, and there were absolutely no maps of Port-au-Prince you can see. The earthquake happened, they released the satellite images, and the um, Crisis Mappers Network was able to use open maps and go in there and put down all the roads where there actually were the roads in Port-au-Prince and where there was a stuff in the streets and you couldn't get by. So emergency responders that were flying in could actually figure out where to go and how to get there. And this was done with 3,000 people offering their time from a great distance. So uh, to close, um, I want to say, I'm hoping you're enjoying this picture here of empty suits that are headless. Um, industrial capitalism is the corporation's survival is its center. You know, that's what really matters. And I think it has its place, and there's lots of things we can only big and build in a big way, but there absolutely is a really important thing happening right now, which is the rise of the collaborative economy, where people thrive at the center, and we're going to win. Thank you. <laughs>